Hello, I'm Professor Afshar at Glendale Community College. This is Physics 101, Lecture 27. In this lecture, we'll discuss energy. This topic is covered in Chapters 7 and 8 of our textbook by Sir Wei and Jouette. Energy is a ubiquitous concept. It's used not just in physics, but also in chemistry and biology and nearly every engineering discipline. The concept of energy rests on the foundation of work. More precisely, the energy of a system is a measure of its capacity or ability to do work. So we think of energy as a measurement of how much work a system can do. The more work a system can do, the more energy it must have. When at the end of a long day, you say, I'm tired, I have no energy left, what you're really saying is that you can no longer perform work. You're tired, therefore you cannot exert forces on the objects around you, you cannot influence them, you cannot perform work, you have lost your ability or capacity to perform work, and therefore we say you have no energy. Now work can be done in a variety of ways using a variety of forces. So we have different types of energy. Each type of energy basically corresponds to a specific way that a specific force is used to perform work. There's kinetic energy, there's gravitational potential energy, there's spring potential energy, chemical energy, nuclear energy, electromagnetic energy, thermal energy, and infinitely many other types of energy. For each way that you can perform work, there is going to be a type of energy. Of course, some types of energy are more relevant or more applicable than others. In this class, for us, we are mostly interested in the first three types of energy listed here. For this class, we'll have to understand kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, and spring potential energy in great detail. So in the next few um, slides, we'll discuss each one of these in detail. The first type of energy that we want to discuss is kinetic energy. As it turns out, an object in motion can perform work. To understand that, imagine that there is a box sitting on the ground. Suppose that we want to move this box. One way to do that, not necessarily the best way, but one way to do that is to throw another object at it. So imagine that there is a ball of mass m, and suppose that we throw this object at the box with some speed v. When the ball collides with the box, it exerts a force on the box, and in exerting that force, it might displace the box, and therefore it will do some amount of work. Remember that work is essentially force times displacement. So we would say that the ball has the ability or the capacity to perform work, and therefore it has some energy. This specific type of energy is referred to as kinetic energy. So the ball's capacity to perform work in this very specific manner is referred to as the kinetic energy of the object, sometimes also described as energy of motion. Now, an important question is how much work can we get out of this ball? In other words, what's the uh, maximum amount of work that I can achieve by throwing this object at other objects? The answer to that question is provided by this formula. The kinetic energy of the ball, which we denote using the letter k, is equal to one-half times its mass times its velocity squared. This formula should look familiar to you because in one of our previous lectures on work, we calculated the minimum work necessary to accelerate an object from rest to speed v. It turns out this expression is exactly equal to that expression. In other words, the work that we put in to accelerate the ball is exactly the work that we can get out later when the ball collides with this object and performs work. So as we just explained, kinetic energy refers to the amount of work that an object in motion can perform if it were to collide with another object. Now you might think that's a pretty uh, useless way of performing work, throwing objects at other objects, but in fact it's very common. It turns out wind energy, for example, is a type of kinetic energy. Wind energy really refers to the kinetic energy 
of air molecules. So when the wind blows, these air molecules acquire some velocity and they begin to move relatively fast and then eventually they collide with the sails of a boat or a ship. They exert a force, they cause displacement, uh, they perform some work and the amount of work that these air molecules can do is related to their kinetic energy. Another example is steam energy. Steam energy is in fact the kinetic energy of water molecules. So when we heat water past its boiling point, the water molecules begin to move very rapidly in random directions. If we could direct that steam at a piston or a turbine, then we can actually move a train or a ship or other objects. So this idea of throwing things at other things to get them to move, to perform work, is quite useful and quite common, and therefore the notion of kinetic energy is extremely important. The second type of energy that we want to discuss is gravitational potential energy. It turns out an object in a gravitational field can perform work. To understand that, consider the scenario shown here. We have two objects connected by a rope, the rope is slung over a pulley. The pulley is basically a disc that is free to rotate and it is suspended from the ceiling. The two objects are a sphere and a block. In a gravitational field, both objects would be pulled downwards. But imagine one of the objects is more massive. If the sphere is more massive, for example, then it will end up moving downwards while the block moves upwards, simply because the weight of the sphere would be greater. A little more precisely, we can say that planet Earth pulls on the sphere, the sphere pulls on the rope, the rope pulls on the block, and the end result is that the block moves upwards. So we can say that the sphere is forcing a displacement in the block, or that the sphere is performing work on the block. Remember that work is basically force times displacement. So if the sphere is exerting a force and causing a displacement of the, uh, of the block, then it is performing work on the block. This ability or capacity of the sphere to perform work uh, is referred to as the gravitational potential energy of the sphere. A natural question to ask is how much work can the sphere do? What is the maximum amount of work that the sphere can do on the block as it falls through a distance h? The answer to that question is provided by this formula. We use u sub g to denote gravitational potential energy, and the gravitational potential energy of the sphere is equal to its mass times gravitational acceleration, which on planet Earth is 9.8, times the height through which the sphere falls. This equation should look familiar to you if you recall in a previous lecture on work we calculated the minimum work necessary to lift an object off the ground. What we're seeing here is that the input of work is equal to the output of work. In other words, the work that was performed to lift the sphere off the ground to height h is exactly equal to the work that the sphere can now perform on the block as it falls back down through height h. So we have described gravitational potential energy essentially as the work that is performed as an object changes its uh, height or elevation. This type of work is actually a very common way of performing work. For example, hydroelectric energy is really just gravitational potential energy of water molecules moving downstream in a river. We take advantage of the fact that these water molecules are changing their height to operate dams, to generate electricity, or to rotate water wheels. Of course, the water molecules had to reach a higher elevation to begin with. That's usually done through the water cycle, through the energy that's provided by the sun. But as those same water molecules then flow down the mountainside, their height is changing. And as they do that, they have the capacity or ability to perform some work. If those water molecules then collide with the paddles of this water wheel, they can cause the water wheel to rotate. 
If the water wheel is then connected to an electric generator, as in the case of many dams, then we can actually generate electricity. But ultimately, it's the change in the gravitational potential energy of the water molecules that is responsible for the rotation of the water wheels or the generation of electricity. The third type of energy that we want to discuss is spring potential energy. Turns out an object connected to a spring can perform work. For example, if you have a block and you've attached it to a spring, the spring has the ability to perform work on the block. You can pull or push the block and in return the spring will exert a force on the block bringing about a displacement and that force and that displacement mean that the spring is performing some amount of work. The object's capacity to do work in this particular manner is referred to as spring potential energy, sometimes also referred to as elastic potential energy. A natural question then is how much work can we get out of this system? How much work can this spring do for us? And the answer is provided by this equation. We will use U sub S to denote spring potential energy. And the spring potential energy is equal to one half times the spring constant times the displacement of the spring squared. This equation should look familiar to you if you remember in one of our previous lectures on work, we'll calculated the minimum amount of work that was necessary to displace an object connected to a spring. Once again, the input of energy is equal to the output of energy. More precisely, the amount of work that was done to move or displace the block is exactly the amount of work that we can later get out of the spring. We've discussed three types of energy in great detail. However, there are many, many other types of energy as well. To measure any one of them, we need a unit of measurement. The SI unit of energy is the joule, named in honor of English physicist James Joule. Note that the unit for energy is exactly the same as the unit for work because the two concepts are related. Energy is the amount of work that we can get out of a system. The joule is usually preferred by physicists. It's approximately uh, the amount of energy that is required to lift a small apple a distance of one meter. So if you want to know how much one joule of energy is, Imagine lifting a small apple by a distance of one meter off of a table, let's say, and in doing so you have performed one joule of work or used one joule of energy. We can also express the joule as a newton meter. After all, remember that work is the product of force and distance. Force, of course, is measured in newtons and distance or displacement is measured in meters, so one joule is equal to one newton meter. Now energy is a ubiquitous concept. It's used by many different people in many different disciplines. As a result, there are many other units of energy and we need to be familiar with them. Another common unit of energy is the calorie, which is mostly preferred by chemists. One calorie is defined as the energy that is required to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So if you consider one gram of water, which is about one cubic centimeter of water, and imagine that you're heating it from, let's say, 80 degrees Celsius to 81 degree uh, Celsius, the amount of energy required to achieve that is called one calorie. One calorie is equal to 4.186 joules. This is not a number you need to memorize, but given this number, you should be able to perform a conversion between joules and calories. Another common unit of energy is the calorie with a big C. This unit is preferred by biologists and nutritionists. If you've ever looked at nutrition labels on foods, you may have seen something like this. This particular nutrition label indicates that this can of soda can provide 140 calories of energy. In other words, if you drink this can of soda, 
through metabolism, you can derive 140 calories of energy from it, and therefore you can perform 140 calories of work. Of course, if you don't perform that work, then your body will turn that energy into fat and store it for later use. One calorie with a capital C is equal to a thousand calories with a lowercase c, and therefore one calorie with a big C is sometimes referred to as a kilocalorie, which is also equal to 4,186 joules of energy. Another common unit of energy is the kilowatt hour, which is mostly preferred by engineers. This is a nice unit because it's well suited to appliances and electrical usage. For example, the average uh, American person uses approximately 10 kilowatt hours of electricity uh, per day. One kilowatt hour of energy is equal to 3.6 megajoules or million joules of energy. The details of the conversion aren't that important. You can just memorize this conversion factor. But if you want to know where the 3.6 megajoules comes from, this is how you perform the conversion. First, you need to remember that one kilowatt is equal to a thousand watts. Then you also need to know that a single watt is equal to one joule per second. This is something new. We haven't discussed the watt yet. We will discuss the watt when we talk about power very soon. But for now, just trust me that one watt is equal to one joule per second. And you also need to know that there are 3,600 seconds per hour. Put all this into your calculator and you will find that one kilowatt hour is really equal to 3.6 million joules. And that's the end of this lecture. Thank you for your attention.